First, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me for this uh, very cool event. Second, I would like to declare that I, as far as I know, I don't have any conflicts of interests uh, that I could disclose. And with that, that would, I would like to start. So if you want to use uh, TMS, not for therapy or for a diagnosis, but to learn about how the brain is functioning and how it is organized, then we have to consider different levels of um, description, multiple levels of description. First of all, of course, the experimental side, uh, we have to place and orient the coil in a def defined way with respect to the head surface or to the head um, with the aid of neural navigation, for example. Sometimes even uh, we might have uh, the aid of robotic arms. Once we know the position and orientation of the coil, uh, and the geometry of the head, we might be able to compute uh, the electric field that's actually induced in the head uh, using state-of-the-art software such as SimLips. But this electric field in itself is not what we are interested in. We need to know how the electric field is actually um, influencing the functioning of neurons. So the state variables of neurons, the immediate ones, like uh, membrane potentials or firing rate, but also, as we learned, have learned to, uh, yesterday, it's very important uh, to know about how um, the long-term behavior of neurons is influenced. Yeah? Uh, the key word is uh, plasticity. Once we know how neurons are activated, uh, it's still not the end because neurons are embedded in larger networks. And uh, what, we are, what is really important is uh, the network response. So the change in neurodynamics in response to changes in um, neural properties in response to changes in electric field in response to stimulation. And all that creates um, ch changes that we can observe in our experiment response or readout variables, which can be behavioral, physiological, or in terms of brain activity. And in this whole chain, the two end links are actually what we can observe, but what is in the middle, uh, we can only access via modeling. And by doing so, we can learn about how um, uh, the brain is actually, or how uh, brain function is implemented in the neural network, uh, how it is mechanistically organized. Or if we take this level here, we can learn about uh, how the brain is anatomically functionally organized. And especially with respect to this um, aspect, um, there are a number of key questions we would like to answer. Um, the first and important one, and most important one is the target localization. So we want to know where are the neurons located, the stimulation of which is related to the observed or expected readout effects. This is not as trivial as it might uh, seem at first glance, since each stimulation is actually uh, producing electric fields in a larger area, quite a, a lot of sites, all of which could um, give rise to some observable uh, changes. So we have to, um, yeah, we have to find ways to uh, further pinpoint, uh, pinpoint the target location. Once we have the target location, of course, we want to know which strength and direction of the field is, uh, is needed to cause a certain effect. And if you know all that, um, we, of course, want to uh, find optimal stimulation parameters that optimally stimulate these um, target neurons with minimal stimulation of anything else. So this targeting is an, essentially an optimization uh, problem, which I will not uh, talk about today. I would like to concentrate on the first two questions. Um, classically and traditionally, this is done by exhaustive mapping. So I just uh, define a region of interest, I define a grid of points, then I place my coil point by point, either directly by um, projection of the coil center onto the cortex, or a bit more sophisticated, uh, if I have an on-the-fly uh, field calculation, I can also place uh, the field maximum at each of these uh, uh, positions. But nonetheless, in each position, I would also have to scan the, uh, the orientation space, so I would have to try out all the different orientations. And finally, at each, each position orientation um, combination, I would have to map out uh, an input-output relationship. 
by finding a threshold or mapping out an entire, entire input-output curve like here. So this is an exhaustive optimization in four or more dimensions, which is either costly or imprecise or both. So can we do better is the question. And one approach that has been uh, proposed um, for this is what I call correlative, correlative target localization. So there have been publications uh, from Access Group, for example, and the Luxo publication here. Uh, and these methods are based on the assumption that at the cortical location that underlies the induced effect, there should be a unique relationship between the effect size and the electric field that is induced. The effect size, for example, being a peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of uh, motor evoked potentials, but there are many others possible. And the electric field that is induced in each, on each side uh, of the cortex can be um, computed from our knowledge of coil orientation, position, stimulation intensity, and head geometry. And between these two, we would like to have a unique relationship. Of course, in reality, yeah, in, in theory, we would uh, require that each E field produces exactly one MEP amplitude, for example, no matter how this E field in this voxel has been generated by which combination of coil orientation, position, and intensity. In rea reality, this is, of course, uh, only imperfectly the case because we know that uh, the readout variables do not only depend on the stimulation parameters on the, on the electric field, but also on the current state of the brain, for example, the phase of certain brain oscillations and other parameters, as you have heard yesterday in the cognitive session as well. Um, but there should be a, a unique as possible relationship. And in order to explore this, uh, we might um, at first, in, in, in the first trial, we might use um, this one of the simplest experiments uh, that you can do with TMS, namely stimulating the primary motor cortex and then um, measuring um, MEP amplitudes, so motor evoked potential amplitudes. And we define a region of interest over the contralateral yeah, greater motor cortex, if you like. Uh, at different position, we place our coils and at different orientations at each positions, at each position. And for each of this uh, of these uh, position orientation combinations, we perform many stimulations. So we administer many pulses uh, with different intensity thereby mapping out the input-output curve or input-output relationship, like we can see here. And then we can actually fit the sigmoidal, sigmoidal curve into it, for example. And for each condition, that means combination of uh, position and orientation, of course, this curve looks different. Uh, it, some, some conditions uh, stimulate or are more suitable for stimulation of the primary motor cortex, others are not, so this uh, curve is shifted, squeezed, or extended along the horizontal axis. For each voxel, we can now translate this input-output curve into a relationship between electric field and MEP amplitude, which is essentially means shifting, squeezing, or extending the curve um, along the x-axis. And the reasoning now is that um, at positions, at locations where the neurons are actually stimulated that cause the effect or the stimul the, uh, stimulated and the stimulation causes the effect we are observing, um, that these curves should lie on top of each other. You know? There should be a unique relationship, while at other, si other sides this is not the case. And this agreement between the input-output curves we call congruence factor. It can be quantified in different ways, and that leads to the congruence factor, which can be mapped over the cortex, and where we find the peaks of this congruence factors. Factor we have the locations that are most the most suitable or the most uh, plausible targets. Okay, um, so how what can we do with that? Does that work? So if we, for for example, perform a motor evoked potential experiment with only two different coil positions and three different orientations at each coil position. So not too many conditions, only six conditions. Then in many cases, um, we can already see that um, we get a hotspot, so a maximum of the congruence map, where we would approximately expect it, namely on the precentral gyrus in the hand area where the hand knob is. 
these three columns here uh, represent three different components of fields that we have considered, namely the radial component, radial to the cortical surface, the tangential component, and the magnitude, which of course combines both. And what we can see first is that for the radial component, there is no uh, voxel where there is a unique correlation between stimulation, so between the no, sorry, between the radial component of the field and our readout. So that the, the radial field component doesn't seem to cause the effect in the, in the tangential and in the magnitude that is actually containing the tangential, we have this hotspot. And many of the subjects really get a plausible result here as we would expect it. But there are also subjects where we get yeah, these dual hotspots on both sides of the central sulcus or even only or mainly on the posterior side of the central sulcus in the somatosensory cortex. So uh, probably it would be a mistake now to conclude that there might be different um, yeah, elicitation mechanisms for motor evoked potentials that might involve the somatosensory cortex. It is much more likely that uh, we simply didn't use enough position orientation combinations because the whole method relies on the fact that each position on the cortex can be distinguished by the differential influence of the different position orientation combinations um, in terms of field that is elicited there. So and if I don't have enough combinations, then there might be sites that receive exactly or approximately the same profile. So in order to map or to, to explore this possibility, um, we might perform, or we did perform actually, um, a second experiment with many more conditions, namely about 20 conditions, four positions and five different orientations at each position. And this is about, um, yeah, this is, um, leads to about 3,500 pulses to map out all these different I.O. curves. So it's quite a lengthy experiment lasting for a couple of hours. Um, but now we have the possibility to check out different combinations of conditions and concerning their um, performance. So the combinations are here sorted according to how many conditions they're actually um, involved. So two different position orientation combinations, three different ones, four different ones. And of course, in each of these cases, I have many different possibilities. Altogether, uh, 20 um, conditions yield um, about or more than 1 million different combinations, actually. Yeah? And we tried all of them. And then, of course, we have to somehow define a goodness of a congruence map. So what is a good congruence map and what is a bad one? And since the whole method is, um, um, the, or the, the principle of the method is to distinguish between different sites on the cortex yeah, to exclude certain solutions. And since we know that in our experiment, um, probably a small patch of cortex is actually responsible uh, for the elicited um, motor evoked potentials in the hand muscle. Because of that, um, the goodness of a congruence map is probably um, related to its peakiness or focality. And this focality can be uh, quantified by thresholding the map and then uh, measuring the area. So we can see the more conditions we actually use, the better the whole thing becomes. Yeah? We go down with our area, that means the map becomes more focal. That applies for the median. Yeah? It's always the median of all the different combinations, for example, for, of six uh, conditions, but also the worst possible one. But if we take the best possible combination for each number of conditions, we see it saturates already at five or six. That means if you, if you have some means to find optimal position combination um, orientations beforehand, uh, combinations beforehand, then uh, we don't have to stimulate so many times. Yeah? We can uh, shorten the experiment and um, stimulate only, uh, acquire only five or six I.O. curves. But that requires that we have some uh, proxy that we can compute beforehand of the expected I.O. Uh, sorry, congruence map. And one, of, uh, one such proxy might involve the variability of the electric field across conditions, because we, we need the whole, the whole method uh, is based upon the assumption that each voxel is influenced differentially by the different conditions. So if you, if you correlate 
the focality of the um, congruence map with the variability of the electric fields, then you find some correlation, as you can see here. However, this relationship is also a little bit disappointing because it is very, very noisy and um, it's probably not in, it, in itself not suited to really make a good prediction whether a combination of orientations and uh, positions is a good one. So we still have to, to do research on that. It's, it's an ongoing question, actually. So, but uh, what do we actually get um, from these 20 conditions? So if you use all of them. For the cases, uh, which already yielded a plausible result for the original six conditions, the 20 conditions don't add much. And if I pick out the best, the six best out of these 20, uh, we get the same result. However, in the cases where I get less plausible results for the six conditions, we see that I get a more unique result, also a correction here on the, on the pre-central uh, uh, gyrus, more in the direction of the hand knob. So it seems to be that we had an undersampling here and the result was biased. So with these three uh, cases here, yeah, um, I just remind you that for the six conditions, we need about 1000 pulses to map out the IO curves, which um, lasts about one and a half, two hours. And uh, for 20 conditions, which uh, in all cases, um, safely delivers a unique and plausible result, uh, um, we need 3,500 pulses about four or five hours of experimental time. So this is not what we can call efficient. So what can we do in order to improve the situation? Now we are actually performing a two-stage regression. We first waste a lot of points, a lot of pulses, in order to carefully map out such an I.O. curve for one position orientation combination. And then we look at the agreement between the different I.O. curves. If instead we would only do one measure, one pulse for each position orientation combination um, and deliver the same number of pulses, um, then we would obtain, we would obtain much more feed variability. So this gives hope that in, with such an approach, we could cope with uh, far fewer uh, stimulations and get a similar result. We tried that out. Uh, we just defined the region of interest over the motor cortex, and then we stimulate it. At each position orientation, one pulse with one fixed intensity. The positions and orientations were chosen randomly. There are so many, uh, so it doesn't really matter what they actually are. They should all be different. That's the only requirement. That also makes the experiment quite easy. Yeah? You just randomly stimulate over this area, yeah? actually on the other side. And then you do the same thing as before. You compute the regression between all these points. And now we only have for each voxel, we have one I.O. curve and not uh, many, which we then have to um, compare with each other. We got just that one I.O. curve and the regression coefficient can be directly used as a congruence factor and mapped the same time, uh, the same uh, way as before. And this really seems to work. Um, we try that out. Um, with uh, three different readouts. So this time we actually measure three different muscles in the hand in order to be able to distinguish between the representations of these three different fingers. And uh, we could uh, reproducibly uh, yeah, localize and distinguish uh, the locations of these uh, finger representations in the premotor and uh, M1 cortex. And uh, sorry, as you can see here, we did that in a lot of subjects. We also did the validation experiment. I don't want to present here. You can read that in our paper. Um, so that seems to work reliably. But the question remains, uh, did we really achieve our uh, goal with uh, improving the efficiency of the experiment? So is it still so insanely long or not? Actually, we performed 1,000 pulses. Yeah, so we administered 1,000 pulses, so which is not 3,500, but still very long. But that gave us the opportunity again to uh, test uh, the algorithm for different sets out drawn from these 1,000 pulses of different sizes, yeah, from 10 up to the whole 1,000. And for each size, uh, we did uh, we, we drew 100 samples to get some statistics. And then our question would be, 
yeah, when does the obtained uh, con congruence map actually converge? Then would it not change anymore? Um, you can compare, of course, to the congruence map you get for the full 1,000 uh, steps. Yeah, so we'll compare, for example, 100, uh, the result for 100 pulses with the 1,000 uh, pulse, which you take somehow as the final result or as the um, as a silver standard. We, we do not have a gold standard, um, which is somehow justified because we have this exponential decay here. Remember, this is uh, logarithmic. Um, and this is lower rhythmic as well. So one criterion could be, okay, we want to have with a 95% confidence a, um, a result which is um, only 5% different from the final result, measure, as measured as a no, uh, by the normalized root mean square deviation. And if we do so, then uh, we find that we only need less than 100 pulses to achieve that result. Uh, which is something like uh, 15 minutes uh, stimulation. And if in a real experiment, we do not have this comparison to the full 1000 uh, stimulations because our goal is not to stimulate that many times, um, we might compare subsequent um, numbers, set, set sizes here. So what happens if I um, have stimulated 100 times and then I stimulated for the 101st time? So what uh, improvement in the congruence map I would get that uh, corresponds to this 5% and uh, there we can, uh, or we find that we have about 2% improvement. So if you have 2% improvement or below 2% improvement between uh, two subsequent uh, stimulations, then you might, you can stop actually. So this is a huge improvement, yeah? So we can really do the experiment in uh, reasonable times. And that is about what I uh, wanted to uh, report about what we did. Uh, just let me discuss briefly um, what is actually uh, achieved and what is open. So what we have is a quite a robust um, way to um, to, to localize the target that is based on random positions and orientations. And that is very advantageous. First of all, we have maximized our information gain, um, even without the necessity to, to uh, do any ad hoc computations or optimizations or anything. Um, but the second thing is, of course, it's, it's a dead easy experiment. So we don't have to, um, to we don't need any new, or we, we use some neural navigation, but only to stay within the region of interest. Otherwise, we don't have to uh, use elaborate procedures. However, we also have seen that if we use optimal positions and orientations, maybe I go, uh, I forgot to mention um, that at each of these set sizes, this is the average, yeah, just random positions, but if I pick out the optimal ones, yeah, then uh, I can reach that criterion already after a few stimulations. Yeah, it's just 10 pulses or something like that, yeah, which is of course extremely interesting. So if I could find these optimal um, positions, orientations uh, beforehand, it might be worthwhile to take the pain to really place the coil there. And yeah, and because of that, um, yeah, it, it might be it might be worthwhile to pursue this, and uh, but this uh, leaves us with a number of crucial questions um, we are currently working on, and that, in our opinion, are the ones we have to answer in the future. Uh, first, how to position the coil? Yeah? So, how can we really reproducibly uh, position the coil? Um, of course, the experimenter can do that uh, by means of neural navigation, but uh, currently we are uh, working on a procedure that relies on a robotic arm. To really be able to do that reproducibly, place the coil at pre-computed positions and orientations. Then, of course, the question I already mentioned about the right optimization criterion that is still to be researched upon. Um, we want to generalize, of course, for the whole thing that we now have tried with modal load potentials to other more interesting experiments and readout types, which have uh, might have uh, other conditions in terms of signal to noise ratio in terms of the shape of the input output curve and so on. And in connection with that, especially we would like to move to the situation where there are multiple locations in the cortex that influence uh, my target, target variable, either independently in an additive way or dependently, for example, in a multiplicative way. 
And this moves the whole uh, problem from univariate regression that we have to do now to a multivariate regression, which is of course computationally challenging. For example, if I just uh, accept or expect uh, that there are two locations uh, that both uh, influence uh, my result, then I would have to do a bivariate uh, regression for all pairs of positions in my region of interest. And with that, I would like to finish and uh, finally thank uh, my collaborators, especially Konstantin Weiser and Ole Numsen, who are the two brains behind all this, so who did all that work, and also Axel, Gesa and Anna for contributing and uh, uh, our um, grant agencies. Yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs>